Welcome to the Mobility Innovators Podcast. Hello everyone. I'm so happy to welcome all listeners from around the world to the Mobility Innovators Podcast. I'm your host Jaspal Singh. Mobility Innovators Podcast invite key innovator in the transportation and logistics sector to share their thought about the key changes in the sector, about their work and what is their forecast for the future. Today, I'll be talking about two of my favorite topic, technology and angel investment. Our today guest is a real hustler. She's the founder and general partner of Lucas Venture. Based in West Palm Beach, Florida, she has built a syndicate of around 3000 angel investors who has invested in more than 280 startups. She is a graduate of Duke University and Harvard Law School and also serve as a partner at Jupiter, a Florida-based real estate finance fund with 3 billion dollar in asset under management. I'm so happy to welcome Ashley Lucas, founder and general partner Lucas Venture. Before starting this episode, I would like to share a few general definition for the audience. An angel investor, also known as private investor, seed investor or angel funder, is a high net worth individual who provide financial backing for small startups or entrepreneurs, typically in exchange for ownership equity in the company. Venture capital is a form of a private equity financing that is provided by a venture capital firm or a fund. to a startup early stage or emerging company that have been deemed to have high growth potential or which has demonstrated high growth an investment thesis is a strategy by which a venture capital fund make money for the fund investor now it's time to listen and learn hello ashley uh, thank you so much for joining us on this show i'm really looking forward to our conversation today uh, thank you thank you for having me So today I'll be spending time getting to know more about you about Lucas Venture your journey as an angel investor and your thought on the key trend in the private funding market to begin with I would like you to share with our listener a little bit about yourself and also are there any interesting fact about your career that are not on LinkedIn Uh sure ha- happy to do it though I I think I'm I think I'm a pretty <laughs> I'm a pretty open book um <laughs> Uh, so my my background um I started my career uh as a as a capital markets lawyer uh I guess maybe the one fact the way that's not on there but maybe is becoming more apparent is I I never actually uh really wanted to be a lawyer it was kind of one of those things where I felt like I'd I was a political science major and and felt like I'd have a reasonable aptitude for it and I also felt like uh you know there's a pretty good path of lawyers going on to do other things within business and then it felt like I could at least kind of be in the rooms with uh, with different types of deal making until I could kind of stumble yeah. on stumble on uh what my thing was so um I first started out uh working in uh in Europe mostly underwriter side work and and debt uh in the capital markets uh and then came back to the states uh where I did mostly issuer side work and uh you know public offerings and SEC reporting and that kind of thing um and then 8 years ago I ended up joining uh the group where I still am now as a partner so uh we have a real estate development arm uh we own and operate some different assets sports arenas mixed use properties entertainment uh and then yeah. we have a commercial real estate uh focused fund as well um I started getting active in venture about four 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 years ago and first it just started out um investing my my own money in a way of diversifying trying to figure out ways to to build wealth and then became uh an obsession and, <laughs> and uh and it seemingly escalated uh ever, ever since um and about you know halfway through the journey so coming up on 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 2 years ago um i just started i decided decided to start investing uh via spvs uh, uh aka forming a syndicate syndicate which i uh run on the angelist platform which is how I how I met your host um yeah. and so uh in in that uh July will be 2 years and in that time um have built the syndicate membership up to about almost 3500 folks uh distributed uh, all around the world and have deployed uh around 80 million into a wide variety of startups uh, also across the globe across all sectors and stages yeah. and geographies so uh it's been quite a ride and 
Um, you know, as we'll get into, I've, I've seen a bit of the boom times, especially uh, last year with the way things were going with valuations and, and exits. And now, uh, you know, apparently winter is coming. So it's, a, it's an interesting, <laughs> it's an interesting time uh, to be in the space. Um, you know, I don't know that I necessarily have a, a, a unique perspective on where we are, but I think having my, my background coming from law, coming from, from real estate, uh, coming from working in a business where you have to earn money day one to keep the lights on and there's no one coming in to save the day. Um, I think the, uh, I, I think I'm, I'm not as a, a afraid as other folks. And, you know, my whole philosophy is, you know, kind of the most opportunity is in, in these times of, of trouble. So, you know, I'm actually pretty excited because, uh, you know, companies we'd never heard of before are going to come out yeah. of all of this and kind of be the next household name. So it's about, uh, being in the game to be able to take advantage of that. Yeah, no, that's that's a great point. You mentioned uh, that uh, this winter will bring new more companies. So Airbnb, Uber, uh, there are a lot of more company which came from the last recession. So we probably see a new one coming up. And and you rightly mentioned you started your career as a lawyer. So I, I put a quote like a lawyer by the day and the investor at the night. So you're working mm -hmm. <laughs> day and night uh, on, on both of your passion. Uh, so you are a solo VC and leading your own angel syndicate, which you just mentioned, and you are managing the whole process yourself, uh, which helped to make investment decision quicker, but at the same time, put a lot of work and a lot of pressure on you because you need to conduct the due diligence process and write investment memos and all. So can you share how this deal process and syndicate actually work? And let's say you meet a founder and you want to invest in a company. What are the key steps to be followed and how long does this, the entire process take? Yeah. So, I mean, hopefully in, in this, in this, in this realm, the, the more you do it, the more efficient you become. And so, you know, what the process looked like two years ago versus what it looks like <laughs> now are, 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 are a little different though. Uh, I'm sure though I'll be like most folks going through another bit of point of, of having to adapt and involved in, in adjusting to kind of where the, the macroeconomic situation is, but you know, basically, if I meet a founder. Uh, we, you know, obviously, have my kind of have my initial initial call. Uh, you know, we'll get you know initial data room things like that. Um, and then, you know, one benefit for me for from having that legal background is, you know, diligence is something that I was trained to do. <laughs> to trained to do so. <laughs> Uh, for me as a solo VC, I guess it, it may, maybe comes a bit easier than most. You know, when I started out, particularly as a junior lawyer, you know, put together data rooms, reviewed all the documents in data rooms, synthesized all that, elevated issues, et cetera. So for me, um, that comes a bit second nature. And, you know, one of the benefits about, um, you know, the, the, the networking that I've been able to accomplish and different you know, communities within this uh, startup ecosystem I've been able to be a part of and, and, and all and the members of the syndicate is, is that in, in, I, it may be a solo VC, but I'm, I'm not alone. Right. So yeah. uh, if I have things that are kind of out of my core competency, but I think are really interesting, I kind of have go-to people that I can go to who I trust, uh, who can be a second set of eyes, whether it's technical diligence, whether it's market diligence, or even uh, kind of like geo specific stuff. So, for example, if I you know I invest a lot in 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 Latam and India, places like that, and I have specific folks who I who 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 have robust portfolios or who are there on the ground uh, and can give me a sense check beyond just my own kind of intuition and and then what I'm what I'm what I'm what I'm reading in diligence. So that's kind of my process. And then from meeting the founder. Um, you know, all the way through the investment and diligence process. I mean, I, ideally, that's like a, that's like a two to three week uh, kind of end to end process now because just, uh, you know, just getting just getting more just getting more efficient uh, in terms of knowing what I'm looking for. And from a diligence perspective, knowing who my res what my resources are. Uh, and knowing, you know, uh, when I when I when I go out to LPs, you know, the kind of notes that I want to hit and what resonates. And again, same thing with, you know, memos and messages and things like that. Just getting a lot of reps and, you know, just makes you more more efficient being able to, to deal with it and, and have uh, faster speed of execution, which, 
you know, in a, in a bull market was really necessary because frankly, yeah. you know, in those bull markets, sometimes you might have you know, <laughs> 10 days to do everything. Um, whereas now I actually expect the timeline will be, uh, will, will be much, will be much longer. Uh, so it won't be that same rush, but it was, it was definitely good, uh, good practice for me getting everything, uh, in, in order. That's pretty fast. Two to three week uh, is pretty fast. In fact, I remember I spoke to a couple of you invested mm-hmm. and that's what they tell that you complete things very fast and you're very efficient and all. In fact, there is an old saying which say that you can't hide anything from your doctor and your lawyer. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I think founder cannot hide anything from you. So now a little bit about your portfolio. And you mentioned that uh, already that you invested in so many companies around the world. In fact, when I did the last count, it was 282 companies in last four years, which is phenomenal. And you have already exited more than 10 companies. So what is your thesis and what are your investment strategy? And uh, also if you can share a little more about like how the angel investors are different than the venture capital firm. Yeah. So if I miss any part of that, please feel free to follow up. So, you know, I, I, I am very much um, a a generalist and I like to say an offer, an offer, an an opportunist. Um, and so because I've kind of cultivated those relationships uh, in terms of geography, discipline, et cetera, any, any deal that, that looks potentially credible, interesting, that has the potential to be some, a category kind of defining opportunity uh, is something that I'm going to take a, take a serious uh, look at. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm very open and I, and I don't close the door. Uh, on on most things. And for me, you know, going into angel investing, I had a similar mindset to, uh, you know, public investing, even things that I do in in real estate, the number one word is, you know, diversity, Uh, you know, when you when you in venture, they, you know, they there's this, you know, thought of, you know, don't don't spray and pray or whatever they say, but I was like, you know, I think that's a bit snooty. I, I, I would agree with that. But to me, there's there's a difference between that and indexing, and so what I've always wanted to do is index. Um, and for me, you know, I've kind of now I'm experiencing two events through that strategy. It's worked well. First being, you know, I started investing whatever 2018 was was the shock of COVID, and now yeah. going into 2022, this shock and my portfolio has held up remarkably well over that time. I think because of that diversification and. Uh, no matter how smart or expert you think you may be, uh, we're all pretending to be Nostradamus here. And so I think the, the key line of defense is being diversified. And for me, that means being multi-sector, multi-stage, uh, and then hedging a bit outside of the, the, the U.S. As, as, as well. So again, like I said, my, my strategy um, is, you know, just, uh, you know, really keying in on, 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 like I said, those potentially category defining opportunities. And, and I think, as I've said in many interview, interviews, the reason I can take, I won't say an agnostic approach, but where I can, I guess, be generalist in that way is because I primarily evaluate startups um, outside of like, you know, like biotech and deep tech, which are a bit hmm. different based on, based on distribution. Um, yeah. I think if you strip away uh, AKA product market fit, AKA sales, whatever you want to say it. I think most startups, if you strip away a lot of things, including the product itself, uh, and you really focus on that, uh, you're kind of, you're going to, you're going to get into a lot of potentially successful companies because at the end of the day, uh, you may be enamored with a product, but if you don't have a team uh, and a strategy, that's going to be able to get that into the hand of the end user, you have nothing. And similarly, yeah. I've seen plenty of deals where the product is kind of mediocre, but they're brilliant <laughs> on the <their> go <total> market. <laughs> and they, and they, and you know, they're, and, they, and, they're, and, they're, and there's a big outcome. Uh, so for me, that's been, uh, you know, been my kind of North Star. And then for me, it makes it interesting, right? It's like I get to, like, it's, it's you know, so cool, like day to day. Um, you know, it's a learning process for me. Like yeah. I get to learn about so many different companies and and verticals and all of that. Uh, with that said, I mean, um, I do, you know, from looking at my own portfolio, we'll say though that I, I do probably gravitate more towards certain areas. And that's probably just because of my background. So like, you know, I have like, you know, a ton of FinTech, um, you know, a ton of, a uh, ton of 
uh, companies outside of the U.S. I mean, it's still like 80, 20, 80 percent in the U.S., but I think having an international background, have, having a capital markets background um, probably drives a bit of that. But beyond that, I'm, 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 I'm pretty open. And there was a second part to your question. Of, it was, was it the difference between angels and, and VCs? The VC. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting because as like you you know as an angel or I don't even know what the right right word is because like I said I I invest late stage as well secondaries even but you know I'm uh, you know you don't you don't you have some disadvantages relative to VCs in terms of obviously just the sheer you know ch check size yeah. uh, you know being able to necessarily comb the market in the same way that they have and establish the kind of same. Uh, you know, in in inbound that that kind of thing and branding, but then I also think that you have there are ways to kind of overcome that, and then there are a lot of you know advantages as 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 well. So you know, even if you're an angel or solo VC, it behooves you to to be a part of different communities and networks so you can leverage that and collectively you know have a reach and insight that I don't know if you'll be on par with the the big VCs but you'll you'll be able to do do some damage and you can also do a lot to build your own brand and and get that that top of funnel uh, but then you're also untethered in some pretty cool ways right and that if you're solo VC or angel you're you're the boss you're yeah. judge jury <laughs> and executioner if you if if you especially as a personal angel if you're not managing or you know other people's money if you talk to somebody in 20 minutes and you want to invest that's your prerogative you don't need to go through <laughs> bureaucracy or committees or only be limited to making x type of investments or yeah. unable to make investments outside of a certain mandate so that kind of uh I think autonomy is is pretty powerful, especially if you follow an approach like I do in terms of the the, the indexing. Um, and then the other thing is is also a bit on the economics, right? So I know yeah. what I'm seeing now and what I saw during COVID, which was like a great opportunity for me investing, was that you know when these shock events happened, VC a lot of VCs sit back and they lick their oh, yeah. wounds and they assess. When you're an angel or solo vc or syndicate you can just go 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 and and take advantage of opportunities take advantage of bargains and at the end of the day um of course you want to support your portfolio companies all of that good stuff but you know your your investments each stand on their own uh yeah. and so you can you can keep going you can keep going or you don't have to worry about man i had this really great company but these nine others are horrible and it's it's weighing things down <laughs> and how do i balance that and then you you know you don't have other constraints like for example um, you know target target ownership et cetera like if I want to go and invest in a company and they can only make room for X dollars that's fine because yeah. I don't need to own ten percent five percent whatever it is if it's a really great company that I believe in I just need to get in yeah. uh, and so that's a lower threshold to clear and same thing like no such thing as like competing term sheets and all of that they can make room because of that flexibility if you you know can prove the the other components of your your value add and that's uh, all a great point like you mentioned it can be the king in your own kingdom so you mm -hmm. <laughs> you build your own kingdom and and run it you don't need to depend on external lps you don't need to answer them and also i really like your approach about indexing i didn't realize that like you are balancing all these portfolio companies in a way that it make a index so if there is a recession uh, there should not be too much of downfall. If there is a too much of booming market, it should be moderate. It should not be too high because that's also not good sign. Uh, like mm -hmm. that's what happened in the in the bull market. Uh, so I can follow up on my previous question. And like you mentioned, you are a sector and geograph agnostic, uh, which means you are investing in all sector. And you mentioned that 80% of your companies are in US, but 20% are outside. Uh, FinTech and biotech, you are liking that space. And in fact, I saw like largest holding you have is in fintech. So I can, I can see that, but at the same time you invested in mobility companies. So there are 10 companies in mobility sector, and there are 13 companies in the logistics sector in your portfolio. I have two questions. So how do you assess the potential of these startup? Because like you said, uh, you are sector and uh, you are geographic mm -hmm. agnostic. So how do you assess the potential of these startup? Because they are so different from each other. And how do you place a high value on any factor uh, on the startup? You mentioned about team traction. 
a uh, little bit but what is more important for you as an angel is it the team is it the traction is the market and uh, and do you have any special requirement for mobility and logistics startup because it's a podcast for mobility companies so i just want to understand do you have any special requirement for mobility hmm. companies or logistic companies yeah that's a that's a great question um and I'll, i guess i'll probably take it a bit backwards um mobility you know i had mentioned that you know like something like biotech or de- or like deep tech or things that kind of have a different framework of evaluating I would actually make maybe make the same argument around mobility uh, uh, as well because of course you can look at things like distribution for but that you know that that's going to be more in mobility that's going to be more of a mature company anyway which is a different type of uh, analysis yeah. for me more mobility is 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 a heavy heavy emphasis on 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 team um and so um you know Pref- preferably even you know if it's not a repeat founder i mean folks that have worked within the space and sort of the 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 best of the best types of uh you know organizations and so you know i take one that I, that i had for example um you know uh, uh xos trucks um you know I, it was uh one of the founders was 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 ex tesla so i was like you know like it, it it's the it's those types of thing or and i look for besides the team i also really look at what are they doing even early from a partnership standpoint or what do they have yeah. the ability to do for a partnership standpoint to a degree in this sector i think that is that also kind of gets i guess at my distribution standpoint so i look at something like gadic right and when i invested in them they were it was very early on but they had secured this partnership with Walmart i'm like yeah. doing that at your stage like that really tells me something about who you are as a team it tells me something beyond even what i can read about the you know the potential promise and magnitude of your technology uh and so if, if i if i went down the list and and looked at each of the uh, kind of mobility startups um i think they would all have that commonality where the founders are absolutely top tier technical experts deep experience where they've very early on established that they can win kind of top partnerships and then the other factor is you know um you know obviously it goes without saying you know it's a it's a massive 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 market, market. so <laughs> that so it's like that's that's never really the concern there but even more so than than other sectors it's like what are you doing that's really different because it's also a super saturated market it's not like there aren't a million truck and tire and transportation you know companies you know from from old, from older companies to new so it's like what is your insight that no one else is seeing or what is your technological moat that no one else has mm. and that, and that's really that's really key you know, like if you just come to me and you're doing a bus startup okay okay <laughs> that's not gonna do, that's not gonna that's not gonna do that's not gonna do anything or a slightly better bus than the great i like that it's not the you it's not you can't do the incremental improvement it can't just be marketing it has to be a step function change yeah. uh potentially and so that, that that's really a focus um when it when it comes to that sector no that's a great point you mentioned about the partnership because now i can also relate because i see a lot of mobility startup and all and partnership is a key it's a b2b kind of a segment mm-hmm. so you really need to have those kind of partnership to go ahead and getek is a is a great story because they have a mm-hmm. very unique segment of warehouse to warehouse uh, driverless uh, vehicle mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. walmart is the best partner because they have so many warehouse and and they mm-hmm. can expand so quickly world over mm-hmm. if it's successful mm-hmm. in in us they can quickly successfully go world over now i really like your point about this partnership and the technology moat and and probably i'll use the same function now to evaluate some of these company now my next question which you touch already a little bit there was plenty of money available in the market or i should say it's it's uh, it's now becoming less and less but at the same time there are many more founders and entrepreneur uh, who are working on new idea every day you must be seeing new pitches new ideas and all so do you think the job of an investor and capital allocator is becoming easier or more difficult because when you are getting more idea should i say the job is becoming easier because now you can pick up plenty 
And second is what is your suggestion for the first time founder? Because like you mentioned, if it's a repeated founder, the, the story is easy. You can easily create your story. You can easily tell people what you're doing. But for first time founder who are raising the external funding for the first time, they always face this challenge of how should they start? Where should they be? What process they should follow? Mm-hmm. Yeah, on on the on the first point, um, in, in terms of is it is it is it easier? Um, I, I guess it kind of it depends on the position you're in, right? So speaking from the perspective, a non-fund perspective, um, it, as long as you you, know, you yourself are, are comfortable investing, or you can marshal your your group of folks to invest, um, I would say yes, because the opportunities. Uh, in the inbound are only going to tick up from here as fu- as funds begin to retreat a little or elongate their processes, just as I saw uh, within 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 COVID. If you're a fund, um, you know there may be some difficulty because I think you know LPs are going to be a little more a little bit more <laughs> active and they're in, and they're going to be answering for 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 different things within the portfolio. But I mean I think the opportunities are going to be uh, more robust for sure so long as you actually have you know the powder uh, to to be able to 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 do it. So it'll be it'll be an interesting time uh, for sure. Yeah, and then you you were I guess asking about first time founders. Um, yeah, no, I mean it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a great it's a great question. Uh, you know, like I said, I I for sure have backed plenty of first time founders. Um, for me, it's um it's always really nice if you if of <laughs> course if someone can back a repeat founder, but more often than not, I'm 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 backing uh you know first time founders. Um, and at the end of the day, if a founder can show me that they understand, uh, you know, have insight into the things that I most care about, depending on the 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 sector, uh, then I'm uh, then I'm and I'm good with that. And so it goes back to the conversation that we were just having. At the end of the day, if you show me that you understand distribution, if you show me that with your with your background, with your network. Um, that you can get into enterprises or that you can, you know, have these partnerships or you show me from a technical standpoint, you know, what you've done from a, from a patent perspective, from a uh, portfolio, you know, speaking of uh, logistics, then I'm going to be, then I'm going to be, then I'm going to be comfortable. Uh, But it's about going in and understanding for your sector, kind of what the, what those key aspects are and and being well prepared to, to kind of address those. And so, you know, at the end of the day, this market is is going to be tough for everyone. Of course, you know, it's, it's yeah. things are always going to be a bit easier for repeat founders. Uh, but even the, even they, I think, will, may have more to answer to if if they're if they're repeat but doing something that's you know wholesale different from whatever yeah. uh, they 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 originally uh, you know you know what they originally did. Yeah, no, that's that's true. It's uh, the market is tough for everybody. It doesn't matter whether you're first time or second time founder. If you're doing a completely different job, so you investor end of the day will ask question, which are basic: uh, what is your product market fit, and how will you going to make money and all. Uh, and and now my next question is actually about uh, how to be ready for investor uh, and uh, sending their pitch decks and all. So you must be receiving thousands of pitch deck every month. Uh, in fact, I send you a lot of them and sometimes you say no, uh, because, <laughs> <laughs> uh, because some of them, some of them are not good or some of the ideas are not good. So I'm curious to learn how you evaluate pitch deck, because it's just a short document to create an impression with an investor. And what are the top five things which are a kind of a must in a good pitch deck? Because people, I see a lot of pitch deck, they have 20 mm-hmm. slide to hundred slide, but what are the top five things? They should include, and mm-hmm. which can create impression on the investor. Yeah, so I I have seen ever from pitch decks from from feels like from two slides to a hundred all different formats, <laughs> shapes, and, and colors. But um, I mean, for me, it, it, and you know, and it's really interesting, particularly if it's a company that's not necessarily coming in warm either, and you're in your and in, in trying to make an assessment because you you can't really you can't get on the phone with with everyone who comes yeah. in and so you're make you're looking at a few slides and making a determination if something is worth escalating but for me um you know there's a few things not that they're necessarily in every pitch but you know I know things that will will grab my attention uh number one um 
is uh, is like I said, it's a, it's a bit less than like the concern in mobility, but in general, um, you know, TAM. And so, and not, and not, you know, and everyone, I mean, typically has a, a TAM slide, but I, I get a little more granular in the sense, like I want to walk away from every pitch deck having a very clear view of how they're going to reach a hundred million dollars in revenue. Why? Because bull or bear market, that's pretty much the benchmark to knowing that this is a potential unicorn type of company, irrespective yeah. of, of industry and, and multiple. And so bonus points to the startups who actually spell that out. But if they haven't spelled it out, if they've done enough on kind of the unit economics, the, the obtainable market, and and do their ideal customer profile is and i can do that myself back of the napkin but i was like i need to go i need to every deck for me to take it to the next level i need to understand how you get there right away because that's that's going to be a major thumbs up or thumbs down for me if i if i look at your kind of individual unit economics and i say okay it would take X number of units or X number of contracts or X number of LOIs to get there. And I ask myself, like, how, just from what I know of the industry in general, how realistic or, or not is that? Or this company would have to be like the most profound outlier to possibly get the penetration to get there, then it's a no for me. Um, mm. If I do the math and I'm like, yeah, actually, I actually think with the product and all of that is together, um, they have a really good shot of getting there and it doesn't really actually take a lot uh, in the grand scheme of things to get there, then that's something that I get excited about. So that's number one. Second, obviously not to beat a, deck, a, a dead horse, but if they get into you know explaining a bit more or like really folk showing what they're gonna do from a go-to-market perspective, yeah. Um, and so um, for me, that's essential. I want to know uh, not just who you're targeting, but 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 how. Um, and if that is clear to me, like that hasn't been thought thought out, um, then that's going to be less uh, compelling uh, to me. Um, and in, for me, for me, those are the two most critical points. Everything else is, I think, a bit is a bit standard of course i would love to know about your 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 competition uh maybe that's third because i want to know i want to know not that i'm a, would be deterred by competition but i want to know how well you understand the, yeah. the landscape and so what you're doing to differentiate etc and then everything else though i think it's kind of uh you know boilerplate of course i want to know about the team and all that and all and all that good stuff but for me those are those are kind of the main points no all these are great points uh, the the tam and the market sizing the go to market the uh, the competition because a lot of time founder doesn't even understand what is the competition i mean they say oh there is no competition which is like a big scary <laughs> thing <laughs> if i if any founder tell me there is no competition i tell them okay let's let's wait for the competition to come to start because right. it cannot be that there cannot be any competition uh, right. so thank you for sharing this and and i think people who are listening who are uh, probably reach out to you later on will make sure they have these uh, key component in their slide deck uh, to get your attention uh, like I mentioned, uh, there is plenty of money available in the market uh, if you have a good idea. So even today, even when people are skeptical about investment and all, but I'm still seeing companies are raising more than 100 million of round and all. Mm -hmm. But the founders are not only looking purely for money anymore. I mean, the good founder look for kind of a strategic value. What are the key points that founders should look for while taking investor on board? I remember in your portfolio, you invest in some of the company, not because of uh, the value point of view, but because of the, the strategic value you can bring to those founder and all. What are the thing the founder should look when they bring an investor on board? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, uh, uh, one question that I'll ask a lot about founder from founders, particularly at the early stage, I, is I, I will ask them how they're thinking about their own round composition because it gives me some insight into their thinking and the kind of company that they want to build. Because my advice is you're actually not looking for the same thing in every investor. You should be, you should be building a team that has different strengths. Uh, and so some things are cut and dry. Like, do you potentially want a fund on board who has deep pockets and who can who can continue to invest with you? Sure, that's great. Find someone who can do that. 
Do you want, you know, you want folks who are, you know, potentially industry experts. You want folks who are potentially go-to-market expert. You want people who just potentially have a really wide network and how can help you with like, customer acquisition and 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 hiring and 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 that kind of thing. And so when I look at it as like you don't want the same thing from every person, but what you want to do is walk away from every person understanding what their what their superpower is, and you want to build together a, a, a build a, a team of folks with different superpowers because you know I don't know if you've got ten people on your cap table, or why would you want all ten of them being able to offer you the same thing? I think you want you you want different voices and you also want potentially some folks who are going to challenge you because they think differently than in and everything is not necessarily a a consensus uh that doesn't mean you 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 can do that obviously in a collegial uh enjoy working with them type type of way so no jerks but you know that would be my advice no that's a great advice it's like uh building a team so in a building a team you need founders or co-founder with the complementary skill mm-hmm. not uh, not having all the same skill so i think it's like when you take investor on board you also need to make sure that some investor can help you for the client side but some can help you for the product side and can some can have a deep pocket and all now that's a great point uh, now i want to like to discuss with you about the web3 and blockchain and uh, you haven't invested in many startup in that space as of now and uh, i would say it, in your portfolio there are only seven company in that space uh, you have invested but it's growing and i think crypto and web3 is the best performing portfolio on the angel list with double digit growth in last two year uh, there is a crazy amount of money and funding going into that space what do you think about these technology and how do you envision these technology can be used in our life because there are a lot of this buzz about boring app and uh, the stone and the rock selling for million but what exactly you see these uh, technology can be used in our life yeah i mean th- that's the, that's the thing for me and and for right now why it's not why i think it's exciting it's not a huge part of my portfolio because i think that's that's what we're we're still finding out right and so for me um you know a lot of my plays in the space i guess have been a little bit of picks and shovels and kind of enabling technologies uh, because i think i think to some degrees we still don't really know what those use cases would be i've yeah. seen some interesting applications prop tech like you know putting you know using nfts to sell a property like that's really cool we might i think we saw you know, a long <laughs> way away from that uh being a common type of thing but there there are tons of interesting applications but that's why for me i'm i'm more focused on the enabling stuff because there's also just um you know there's so much out there there's so much that's hype based and that doesn't actually have any form of utility and that's speculative and um to your point you know on something like angelus like right now or over the last year that category by far commands the most attention and fundraising uh and and maybe even the markups but i think a lot of it is going to end up being paper tigers so um you know at the end of the day markups mean nothing only exits do yeah so yeah you might get in a hot you know whatever crypto whatever company and it gets somebody comes in a crossover fund and and marks it up or whatever but that to me that's really meaningless until we see where you, <laughs> where you exit especially especially in 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 this market and so you know um like i said i i think it's all exciting and in the coming years you're going to see you're going to see the folks who build compelling use cases and separate from the from the pack uh but just the sheer volume of money going into it doesn't even support enterprise value that's going to make that something <laughs> that works for works for everyone uh so so like i said my my view is uh like i said i'm really focused on enabling and kind of ecosystem technologies until we can kind of see like who are, who are who are who are built he put the people who are building things that um have true utility that have staying power um and, and i think that 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 will emerge i just don't think it's really clear right now I I agree with you there are a lot of speculation going on. I in fact I know a couple of good startups which are trying to build product in that but it's still a very speculative market and we don't know what will be the end end use case of these companies and all. Now my next question is and actually you are it's very close to your heart because you are a big advocate of more representation of historically underrepresented group in the tech and the investment space. And uh, do you want to share a little bit about your mission and why do you believe 
it's critical for the future growth. Yeah, so I, I think it also is kind of similar to the, the philosophy when I, I was just kind of talking about when even we were talking about founders building teams. Um, and in my view, products, services, ideas are better the more voices that you have adding to that. And so that aligns very much with with uh, with, with 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 diversity. Um, and so uh, in, in my view, you know, I, I obviously I believe in backing diverse startups, but at the end of the day, I, I invest in startups based on, you know, just the, the fundamentals. Though I think if that's all you're looking at, you will actually find that your portfolio is it has has diverse founders if you don't have uh, those that kind of pattern matching and bias, but by the same token. Uh, and my kind of syndicate style of investing, I'm, I'm actually, you know, are probably even more focused on, uh, you know, uh, allowing access to diverse investors um, from a, from ethnicity, from gender, from geography, um, uh, all, all, all of the above. I mean, all are kind of welcome when it comes to, to my syndicate if they're if they're gonna, you know, you know, contribute and and, and be good members. Uh, with the thought of, you know, what better way to kind of, um, you know, potentially create generational wealth by distributing in that way and democratizing access into uh, historically underrepresented folks, um, and then being then being able to bring more voices in, into venture and create, you know, give people track records uh, to be able to to do something similar and and be check writers and check because and check writers matter because they determine who gets funded and that can yeah. kind of also feed up into uh you know more 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 diverse founders being uh supported so you know it, it's it's definitely uh really important to me but like i said not even just for the 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 sake of it though you could argue it's still worthwhile just for the <laughs> sake of it but i mean I, I think it genuinely contributes to 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 better ideas and 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 better companies and i know you know myself even when i you know speak with or advise founders in a number of times they'll tell me something like, you know, like no other investor has actually asked that. And for me, it may sound like, you know, common, you know, in my view, common sense, but I think it comes from the fact that, you know, I don't have a traditional uh, venture background in terms of yeah. even my experience. Um, you know, when I started, when I first started getting going, there was no ecosystem in Florida, like the way there is now. And then of course, uh, just my own kind of life experience from, from being a woman of color and all of that feeds into you know how i think and my life experiences and what i contribute and so um i like to think if you can if you can if you can do that in a robust way uh that's just gonna that's just gonna help everyone well thank you for sharing it's a great mission you have and i, I agree with you it's uh, it's not only diversity for for the investor but also for the founder for the team it, it's always work so it's always bring new skills new knowledge and uh, new thing now you mentioned this point earlier and i just want to go a little deeper into that uh, to understand uh, what is the future of uh, the zoom call vc investment uh, right now in your investment portfolio you have 20 percent of uh, companies invested in africa let mena southeast asia and i'm pretty sure you must have like you have never met them in person like you just had a zoom call and invested in them so pandemic that was a big thing happened during the pandemic like everything shifted to zoom and people start writing check over the zoom but do you think this trend will continue and uh, what's your prediction for the ecosystem of startup in these region because uh, they got a lot of funding during this period of uh, covid and pandemic and all Will it continue or will you see some slowdown of the deal happening over Zoom and in these regions? Yeah, I think I think it's going to continue. I mean, you might see, I think there will be, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle, like in some of the hub cities or, or, or newly formed hub, like hubs like Miami, you'll see more, uh, you'll see more in person, but um, I don't think Zoom investing is going away, especially in, you know in in all of those geographies that you mentioned. You're seeing more and more global VC interest, and you know it's just more, you know, kind of practical to 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 do it to to do it to to do it that way. Uh, and just because of the way companies are company building, right? So you know a lot of companies are going in remote first and and yeah. distributed teams, et cetera. And so I think you know VC will have to continue to um, adapt to that. And I think the, the approach may be, 
Um, you know, I, I could even see because you know, folks are used to it. Maybe maybe it's Zoom first, and then then we meet in person, in person. As, as a way to initially uh, screen it. But I, I don't think that aspect of things is uh, is 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 going away uh, any any anytime soon necessarily. I, I agree with your point. Actually, the truth is in the middle. So we will not mm -hmm. see those historical mm -hmm. uh, record funding. So the, the funding will slow down a bit, but at the same time, we will it will not be very low. So people will continue to invest in these geography because the ecosystem is growing and the new companies and new models are emerging and all. Now, the, the point which you covered a little bit in the beginning is about this funding winter is coming. And, and the market is going through some changes. And like you said, the VCs are holding back the money. A lot of VCs are not even investing. Uh, there was a recent data which say there are $250 billion of dry powder available with the VC. So it's a, a quarter a trillion money, which is with the VC. They are not investing because they are not right now sure about how the market will work. What is your views on this, uh, the, the funding winter? And what is your advice for the founder? Are you giving any special advice to the founder which are in your portfolio or your meeting? Uh, how you see the future coming? Yeah, so like I said, you know, it's this moment we're in may last longer than, than what we experienced with COVID, but I still, still think there were there are similar lessons right i mean at the, at the end of the day you know a lot of vcs are are taking pause but to your point i still look at the fact that there is a ton of dry powder and you know they make their money on on deploying that and, and management <laughs> fees and so they're not just going to sit on that forever so at the end of the day you know this summer uh maybe even through the end of this year is is, is going to probably be a shock to the system but at some point they're gonna get back to deploying capital it's just going to be uh, a bit more orderly than it was than it was before and so for founders um i think you know you know patience is key discipline is key uh and and you know existing companies it's about you know um you know, being being default alive, right? So taking stock, take looking at your burn, all of that good stuff, and making sure you've got enough of a war chest to, you know, ideally go through the next 24, 24 months if if you if you had if you had to. Um, and you know, the the feelings that were in the air six or nine months ago where you're waiting on all these competing term sheets and and you're basically deciding based off of who's going to give you the most ridiculous valuation you've got to put that to the side you got to be a little less concerned about your dilution and caps and be worried about just getting the money that you need to hunker down and build what you're you're building and if you have that mentality um i think you'll i think you'll I think you'll be fine yeah, no, that's a great point about uh, having a runway for at least 24 months. If you have less, uh, there is a high chance that the plane will crash or the startup will shut down. So you need to have a long runway and uh, reduce your burn rate. A lot of startup has increased their burn rate and all. But we are already seeing there are a lot of layoff are happening. And the reason for that is uh, people want to reduce their burn off. So this is my last question, and it's basically about angel investment. So angel mm -hmm. investment is a risky space. At the same time, like you mentioned, it's a very interesting space to build knowledge and wealth. Uh, what is your advice to someone who is new in this investing space and want to become an angel investor? How can an early stage angel investor establish credibility in this space? What is your advice for people who are just looking to enter into this market now? Yeah, so great question. Uh, I mean, for me, and, and maybe you can attest to the same, you know, that probably the most impactful thing that I did starting out was was uh, was joining AngelList uh, because uh, it was an opportunity to meet other like minded folks who are kind of, uh, in, uh, you know, a, a, a being a part of the same journey. Um, is an opportunity to sit back um, in a in, at least to start if you want in a, in a passive way and see tons of deal flow, really dive in, understand market trends, be able to read decks and memos, understand and understand dynamics, and really just uh, learn uh, in, in in with with kind of the the training wheels on. And so for me, that that's a that's a pretty powerful way to do that. And then. In the meantime, uh, be doing what you can to to network because you know one thing I I think I always say is that 
you know, there's a there's a fair amount of luck involved in this in 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 this space. And I don't think the people who win are just necessarily so much you know are materially are smarter than other folks. What I do think they have is access. Uh, mm -hmm. And so you've got to do what you can on your end to make sure you are seeing as many deals as possible. <laughs> Um, so I said, analysts is one tool to do that, but the other is just good old fashioned network, you know, joining, joining angel groups, joining, take fellowships, whatever it is to build, uh, build that network because, you know, you, you, you probably, whoever you are out there, you're probably smart enough to, or whatever, you could probably invest in the next Uber, but it really won't matter if you're not invited to invest. Uh, and so that's my first big piece of advice: <laughs> get as knowledgeable as you can, and do everything you can to make sure you have the most robust deal flow uh, possible. Um, and then, you know, my own personal advice, which I said has been born out for me, like I said, is the is the, is the indexing and and being yeah. and being diverse and, and giving yourself more shots on goal. Uh, to, to be able to kind of get the, the, the big hit that makes a difference in your portfolio. That's true. Uh, it's actually, you need to be at the right time at the right place uh, mm -hmm. for the luck to happen. So if you're mm -hmm. not there, if you're not listening to Uber pitch, and if you're not investing, you cannot make money from that company. You have to be there. No, thank you so much, Ashley. We learned so much about Angel Investment, your thesis and how you invest and a lot of lessons for the founder and all. Uh, in the last, we have this uh, rapid fire round. And I personally put this because I want to understand more Ashley as a person rather than just as an investor or lawyer. So we mm -hmm. ask five questions and you need to just answer them quickly, whatever comes to your mind. So if you're ready, I'll just fire away. Lawyers aren't good with that, but I'll do my best. <laughs> we have to I know, think you know, everything. Yeah, you need, you need time to think. But that's why we have this uh, interesting round, not uh, giving any time to think. So my first okay. question is, if you, are, if you are not in law or investment space, what other profession you would have selected? Oh, man. I, growing up, I wanted to be a host on the Travel Channel. Host on the Travel <laughs> Channel. Oh, man. <laughs> that's, a, that's an interesting profession, I would say. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so the the travel the startup or or the comp the founder who are investing in travel company they should reach out to you the <laughs> <laughs> so my second question is you travel so much around the world in fact you live outside uh, for some time which is your favorite city in the world favorite city in the world would be paris paris and how often you've been there? Like how many times you've been there? Oh God. I mean, definitely more than 10. Um, it was much easier when I, when I was living in London, but even now, um, I, I think the last few years I, I make it there about, uh, you know, I've been going there about once a year, at least over the past couple of years. And I'll be there again in, in August. Oh man. That's, that's definitely your favorite city 10 times. Uh, so mm -hmm. definitely it, it's a lovely city. I've been there. So I yeah. know it's a, it's a lovely city. Yeah. Your favorite startup in the mobility and logistics sector and why? Or any other sector? Uh, and then I got to like call them, uh, got to call them all to mind. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know how it'll, how it'll turn out, but uh, I may, maybe, uh, maybe Wave, W-A-Y-V-E, based out of the UK. Right. Um, and, and, and I'm really just intrigued by them because, you know, they're, they're one of those ones, which is what I called out for this sector that's going right when everybody is going left. So, you know, in terms of autonomous driving, uh, obviously a lot of folks are going after that, but, you know, uh, they, they kind of had a wholly different way of, 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 of looking at it in a true kind of machine learning as opposed to like LIDAR and maps approach. And so, I mean, they could spectacularly fail, but I, I just think it's really interesting <laughs> uh, <laughs> that they, they, they went about it that way. So that's one of the ones that I'm most uh, in, in, intrigued by, right? And then also because obviously whoever is, 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 is right in that space is, is, uh, is going to be on the, in, you know, oh, in, yeah. the, in the, in the fortune 10. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> so. Whosoever will be right, because there are so many of them, but it's yeah. like, which one will be right. Yeah. Uh, my next question is what are your, what are you most excited about this or next year? Uh, this year, this year, I'm always, uh, it's my personality. <laughs> I'm always, I'm always more excited about the present. That's the thing that I have. Uh, that's the thing I have control over. Okay. 
and the, anything which you like about this year you want to do this year like you want to achieve in this year yeah so um you know i think i, I for me personally like i the, the last two years particularly with covid like i was just like a maniac burning myself out <laughs> trying to build trying to build the syndicate and, and and build and 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 build everything i'm building and networking so I actually, for once, am, am looking forward to, uh, to to actually getting back to having a more <laughs> balanced life uh, and doing some more traveling, et cetera. Um, and then also being able to do deals in a in a different type of pace and environment. It's a new, it's you know, it's a new uh, new challenge, new opportunity. Okay, that's a great point, and I I wish you safe travel because I know you are traveling this week as well. So <laughs> have a safe travel. Uh, my next and last question is: If you can change one thing in your life, what would it be? Nothing. Nothing. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, I don't know. Many people feel that way, but you know, I'm I'm like a butterfly effect person, right? Is that is that any? change that you ever go back and make could completely change you kind of where you are now and i feel i feel good about where i am personally professionally and all of it so i'm a i'm a no regrets kind of person that's great uh, no i love that answer and in fact the people who are happy what they found their passion uh give the same answer uh, if you find what you are doing is meaningful to the world and to yourself you always love what you are what you have mm -hmm. achieved in life so thank you so much ashley uh, for your great insight i really love this conversation with you and learn a lot from your experience in fact uh, we had conversation earlier but uh, today conversation you know helped me to know a little more about yourself and yeah no 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 problem at all thanks for having me and and thanks for your, if not day one, pretty close to day one support of the, the syndicate. And so I uh, definitely appreciate that. Thank you for listening to this podcast. We will be inviting some other inspiring guests in the coming week. You can subscribe to this podcast online to get the notification for the next episode. If you would, if you like this podcast, please don't forget to give us a five-star rating as it will help us. If you like this podcast, please don't forget to give us a five-star rating as it will help us to spread our message. If you have any feedback or suggestion for this podcast, please do write to us at info at the rate mobility-innovators.com. I look forward to see you next time. Thank you.